the most important thing that I think people overlook, but they really should know about the EU, is that it represents the most exciting and innovative new type of polity or governance form in the modern era, right? So we think about the EU as this incredibly boring, technocratic, ridiculous organization that's just about lawyers and summits and so on. But actually, if you peel back that sort of layer of the outside of what the EU looks like and really think about what it is, to me, it's a fascinating sort of act of imagination that political elites took at the end of World War II and which has continued to evolve and grow in ways that are really innovative, that it neither replicates the nation state model, nor is it simply uh, a model of a sort of international organization like the WTO. Instead, it really charts this, charts this new path for how to manage all the different tensions, both in terms of security and in terms of uh, economic growth and stability and social stability. Um, and so to me, it's a really fascinating laboratory or experiment um, one that, you know, we're never quite sure is going to succeed or uh, last, but that that to me is the sort of most important and overlooked thing about the EU that people should know. That's one of the most interesting things to really look uh, at is sort of the development of the EU and the way in which um, political leaders sort of shaped the EU's trajectory. So the EU begins uh, as World War II ends. Um, leaders within, within France and Germany um, who are coming out of the sort of failures of their governments in World War II, the cataclysmic failures, right? Um, and they're thinking about, all right, how can we make sure that we have peace and stability on the European continent? And they come up with this idea that let's bind together Germany and France in something called the European Coal and Steel Community, which gets started in 1950. And the idea is that if you, if you pull together all of the sort of um, materials that you need to fight wars, such as coal and steel, right, which are these raw materials that are essential to warfare uh, in the 20th, 20th century, if you actually pull it together so that France can't go off and do its own thing and Germany can't go off and do its own thing, but rather they have to work together in developing these resources, then you're gonna bind these states together in a way that's gonna make it really hard for them to kind of break apart and pursue paths of more aggression and warfare. You're also going to establish this sort of um, economic zone where you're binding these states together because obviously coal and steel are also fundamentally important to the 20th century economy as well. And so it's this really interesting moment where uh, taking the sort of, you know, ashes of World War II and trying to build this cooperative enterprise. Um, and that really forms the kernel kernel to today's EU, right? And they sort of build out from there. Um, the first thing that they do, building on the European coal and steel community, which again, just starts with France and Germany, right? Is they, they enlarge to six of the kind of central states on the European continent. And they sign something called the Treaty of Rome in 1958. And that's really important, is that is the beginnings of a European single market. Again, binding together these states economically so that they're so intertwined that their fates are really merged together and their practices and their sort of everyday interactions are based around this notion of a market that, that can work by being big, by being deep, by allowing for Europe to rebuild after World War II. The U.S. obviously after World War II and, and at the end of World War II was also playing a major role in thinking about reconstructing the global economy, right? With the entire GATT system, with the IMF, with uh, trade treaties and so on. Um, and they did have their eye on Europe because obviously Europe had been this incredibly problematic place, right? For the first half of the 20th century. So they did support very much this notion of a new path for Europe and a, and a, and a new way of, of building trust and cooperation and peace and stability in Europe. But I would say that um, 
it was really something that was driven more by, by European leaders, a guy called Jean Monnet, who is considered one of the quote unquote founding fathers of the European Union, for example. But the, the US did play a really important role in the sense that the EU was able to go for it in this manner, in part because the US had set up NATO, right? Had set up a, the, this treaty organization which guaranteed European security in the face of uh, the Soviet Union growing in strength and power. And so it kind of created this little protected area where the Europeans could imagine, hopefully, that their security was being um, um, protected by the US and they could go forward with these innovative diplomatic uh, and political uh, types of cooperation. If you look back at the history of the EU, it is this quite kind of incremental change over time. I mentioned they start with this uh, coal and steel community, then they move to the single market. And the single market was the notion that they uh, would develop treaty law at the European level, which would guarantee free movement of goods, services, people, and capital, right? And money, right? So all of the sort of fact, what we call the factors of production, right? And so that sounds super boring, but in fact, to do that is an immense kind of um, act of, of letting go of sovereignty, right? So if we think about in the United States, for example, the Interstate Commerce Clause is a sort of similar historic moment, right? Where the states actually began to trade with each other in the United States and create this big open, open space, right? And so the EU kind of works on that, through the 1960s and tries to consolidate that and uh, into the 1970s. And it, at that point, it's called um, the common market. It's called the European community. It goes through a bunch of different name changes, which reflect to some degree its sort of expansion in terms of the different capacities and the different um, powers that the EU has, right? Um, we always say the EU today, even if we're talking about it in the past, because it's too hard to kind of constantly change the terminology that you use, even though the name it was, in fact, European community in the, in the 1970s. So the 1970s are a really tough time, though. I mean, around the world and, and in Europe as well. And it's often referred to as the decade of Eurosclerosis, where, in fact, you know, inflation is, is soaring, right? Prices are soaring but there's very stagnant growth. There's really no, no growth. And so the economies are doing really poorly. It seems like the Europeans are, don't have it together. The whole thing is gonna fall apart. Um, but in the 1980s, you have this really interesting relaunch of the EU. There are a couple key actors who sort of seize the moment and realize that actually out of crisis, they could be sort of political entrepreneurs and actually move forward with a sort of bigger, better, bolder, uh, version of the European community. And so they propose um, this thing, which is known usually as the Maastricht Treaty, because it was signed in Maastricht. And the Maastricht Treaty, or the Treaty on European Union, and thus the new name, the European Union, um, is really this sort of great leap forward in terms of moving beyond simply having a single market and introducing this idea of a single currency, which became, becomes the Euro introducing the idea of much deeper political integration along sort of security, foreign policy lines, and so on. And so in the 1990s, we turned to thinking and calling it the European Union legally. And it really does start to look much more like what we think of as a political union, right? Um, and so that's sort of the really important moment, I think, for the EU. And then once again into the 2000s, sort of consolidating all those various activities, lots of different types of treaties, but they're more sort of at the margins. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know what happens next. Um, things start to fall apart again. So I'll let you ask me questions about that. And that is something that has really um, dogged the EU um, for a very long time, particularly as it gets deeper and deeper into sort of intrusively impacting people's everyday lives within, within Europe. So as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, it starts as this is coal and steel community, right? And then they keep kind of layering on new treaty law, new treaty law. 
And after a while, it becomes clear that the EU really is playing a role that is much more consequential than a kind of normal international organization. That in fact, European people's lives are being impacted in ways that look much more like what happens inside nation states. And a really clear example of this is that over time, uh, the court uh, that, that actually adjudicates all the European treaties, the European Court of Justice, um, actually develops this doctrinal power where its decisions actually supersede national decisions, no matter what they are. So it's very much like our Supreme Court, right? Where the Supreme Court is the supreme law of the land. The European Court is the law of the land and, and supersedes uh, the national courts. Um, at the same time, you have things like the, the Euro, right? So they established this European Central Bank uh, that is responsible for the European currency. It's also responsible for running monetary policy, right? Changing interest rates, buying and selling debt, and so on. And so um, it becomes clear that those activities are going on in a situation that does not look anything like the sort of democratic representation that we have in nation states. And so the EU has struggled mightily um, to navigate that because it's normatively important, right? We believe in democracy, we believe in legitimacy, and it's pragmatically important because you need to make sure that people are on board with what you're doing for this kind of governance system to work. Um, so over time, uh, the EU does have something called the European Parliament, which has members of European Parliament elected from all the different countries in the EU. Over time, the European Parliament has become stronger, but it is in no way has the strength that say the US Congress has. Um, over time, you've had more attention to um, the leadership of the EU and trying to get public engagement and involvement around the choosing of the various leaders. But again, uh, you don't have this sort of direct democracy and direct voting and representation. And so that is one of the most important things that still remains unresolved in the European Union today. Well, you know that this was a, a classic kind of slam that Henry Kissinger had, right? When he said, you know, I, who do you call when you wanna call the EU, right? If there's a foreign policy com, co, uh, crisis, who do American leaders call? Um, so you have a bunch of people running the EU. You have um, somebody who's actually um, runs the European Commission, which is the sort of bureaucracy of the, or I think of it as the bureaucracy of the EU, the sort of administrative um, uh, body that carries out the sort of day-to-day -day, uh, treaty, treaty law. You have what's called the European Council, which is all the heads of state and, of, and government, the nationally elected heads of state and, and government, and that has a, 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 a president. Um, you have, again, the European Parliament as well. Um, you have the head of the European Central Bank, um, but you don't have a, a sort of figurehead in the sense that in the United States, we have a president, or in other countries, Germany, Angela Merkel is the chancellor. Um, and this, I think, creates real confusion on the part of the citizenry, citizenry within the EU, rightly so. So Brexit is a fascinating um, case study in the tensions and difficulties of trying to invent this new form of governance that goes above the state, that is transnational, but at the same time, doesn't simply replicate what the state does, right? It doesn't create the kind of loyalties and attachments that, the, that nationalism in the nation state does. Instead, it tries to sort of navigate what nation states are. And Brexit really shows the failures of, of that effort in certain contexts to me. It also is something that perhaps should not be shocking or surprising. Let's remember that the British were only very reluctant members of the EU. They, uh, dra they dragged their feet, uh, they weren't sure about entering, and then they finally do, and they're constantly putting the brakes on the sort of supranational 
efforts of other states such as, as France and Germany and other states. And so the specifics of Brexit, of course, are very much uh, of a particular moment in British politics, right? You have all kinds of fights going in on inside the Conservative Party. You have fights over what their role in Europe should be. You have fights over who should lead. You have a kind of big disarray in the party. And there is a small party called um, UK Independence Party or UKIP run by this really colorful um, person called Nigel Farage, who, you know, if you ever want to sort of go and, and, and enjoy a performance, you know, just sort of Google him and see some of his videos. And he used the idea of the EU as this kind of absolutely terrible thing that had completely constrained British sovereignty that had sort of driv driven the UK uh, into the ground and that the UK should leave. And so because of these sort of intra-party politics going on in the Conservative Party, you eventually have uh, the Prime Minister of the time, Conservative David Cameron, deciding he's going to hold a referendum on whether the UK should stay inside uh, uh, the EU or not. And they actually had done this before, and uh, they had decided in the referendum to stay. And Cameron and many of his other uh, colleagues thought for sure that the British people would vote to stay inside the EU because the EU meant, you know, free ability to go and live in the south of Spain. It meant uh, the ability to sell your goods and services across the European continent, a much bigger market. It meant this ability to project power abroad that, you know, the UK was just this small little island, but teaming up with, with these other states meant that they could flex their muscle and so on geopolitically. But instead, they were shocked to find out, to wake up and to find out that, in fact, um, by a very small margin, the British people had decided to, in fact, vote to leave. And so it really threw everything into a disarray because the, um, the conservatives did not have a plan for how to leave in an orderly way. Did not, they did not have a plan for how to leave in a way that would allow them to have access to European markets and so on. And so we saw this kind of shambolic kind of, you know, several years of finger pointing and blame and, and changes in the conservative party leadership and so on. And um, in the end, uh, they are leaving. They were able to finally um, decide on a withdrawal agreement with the EU, but many of the specifics around how that's going to happen still remain in the dark. And um, initially, there was a lot of fear that Brit British desire to leave and vote to leave would mean that other countries and populist parties in other countries who were anti-EU um, would consider trying to leave as well. But the British experience actually has been so negative that it actually turned European populist parties away from the notion of leaving the EU towards the notion of reforming the EU. So the, what are called the Eurosceptics now don't offer the notion of leaving the EU in the same way they might have before Brexit happened. So it has been a, a wild ride for the UK public it's been a challenge for the EU, uh, but I think for the EU, it has turned out to actually be something that, that they've been able to sort of figure out how to design around and move forward. So the question of identity is such a complicated one, and we often try to think about identity as some kind of linear thing that, you know, we can kind of count and you know study and rank order our, our identities and so on and i my study of the eu has really made me much more aware that our identities are things that are sort of constantly shifting that we have multiple identities at various points in time and so we need to kind of think across the range of the different identities we hold how they interact how they're activated and that identities are things not only in terms of how we think about our world, but also what we do. That in fact, our daily practices, our everyday lived experiences are really important in how we see the world, how we make meaning of the world. And therefore it makes sense, right? That the people we share those everyday practices with are part of that meaning making, right? And I use the term culture. 
right? I'd much rather sort of talk about the importance in, of culture and how people shape the way they see the world and how they make meanings of the world rather than identity, which in a lot of senses, we tend to think, you know, is like the property of an actor. We have an identity and we carry it around. I tend to think about identities as things that um, are always and everywhere within a particular culture, right? Within a particular context, right? And they have to be constantly um, reproduced over time, right? They're not something fixed that we sort of hold within ourselves. So with that really long introduction, um, when in my last book, The Politics of Everyday Europe, what I came to find in that book was that people did have a sense of a European culture, that the European Union had created what I called symbols and practices over time that very much changed the way people move through their everyday lives in Europe, say versus 1935 or 1885 or 1965. That in 2020, the way people experience their lives is fundamentally different uh, because of Europe. So one of the really straightforward ways we can think about this is if you go to a European airport, um, there'll be different passport lines. And one of the passport lines is, it says EU citizens, right? It used to be that you had your national passports. Now we have in Europe, uh, a European passport. So you'll be a French citizen, but you'll also be a European citizen. And so everybody will have a standardized European passport and then it will have the French seal on it and it will say France, right? And so then you go to your EU citizens uh, line in the airport. And these are sort of everyday, what I call in the book, banal things, right? They're banal, they're just sort of everyday experiences. But I do believe that they subtly shift people's understanding of the world. What they don't do, however, is inflame sort of deep emotional commitments, right? If you look at the history of the nation state, nationalism played a huge role in making the nation state a robust new political form, allowing people to go and fight in wars and die for their nation state. The EU doesn't have that, right? The EU, in fact, um, funny enough, um, is a entity that, that sort of tries to divorce itself from that sort of geopolitics, that tries to actually do what it calls human security, right? Where it thinks about things like climate change as a key security challenge, not territorial conquest, right? So this European identity is very fragile and it's something that does not have the same kind of hold that a national identities have. So in the case of Brexit, I think what was happening is people like Nigel Farage were able to use British national identity, which of course we can talk about as well because it's, it's also English and uh, Northern Ireland and Welsh and Scottish national identities, right? It itself has its own problems or tensions, let's say. Um, so people like Nigel Farage and others were able to kind of activate that sense of Britishness and clash it with that notion of a European identity um, and use that as a political resource to then move Brexit forward. Um, so that's why I think, you know, these things are never settled, right? They're always in progress. And that, you know, what we can, what we can term sort of political development or the evolution of polities is not a fixed thing. It's never ever sort of reaches a finite end. Um, policies are constantly changing and growing. National identities are constantly being reproduced and changed in different ways. Um, and so we'll continue to see that. And I do think that the EU has a real challenge in coming up against these type of deeply felt attachments of nationalism. Uh, but at the same time, it also, the European leaders have known that it would be disastrous to try to coercively force a European identity uh, to displace those national ones. That's a great question. Yeah, so there, I mean, they're really, really striking generational differences in terms of who voted for Brexit, right? Uh, I can't remember the exact numbers, but something like 70% of people, you know, 25 and below voted to stay and, and it flips, right, for sort of 55 and above. 
And I think that's exactly right that, you know, youth growing up in Britain today and across the European continent have never known what it would be to have to show passports at every single border in the EU. They have never known, right? So the, the British kept their pound sterling, right? So they did not move to, to the Euro. But, um, you know, the other, other uh, uh, kids growing up in the EU never grew up with German marks or French francs. All they've known is the sort of, you know, euros in their pocket or the euro symbol, right, on their smartphone when they're, when they're buying things. So I do think that, um, that it does explain the generational differences, that these sort of everyday practices do have this sort of slow incremental saturation effect on the way people see the world. Um, I think the other thing was that the types of opportunities that a European economic space offer is much more um, or are much more attractive to young people who feel like they can kind of innovate and change and deal with a constantly changing world with you know digital economy and all the disruptions that come with that. Whereas I think the older people in Britain um, felt very much shut out of uh, the 21st century economy and to some degree correctly identified the EU with that and thus voted against it. And of course that's very ironic because in, in many instances the place that got the most economic benefits from the EU through the various sort of regional development funds and infrastructure funds and so on and so forth were the places that voted against the EU. So Brexit happens before Trump's election. And for many of us, it was surprising, but perhaps not shocking for all the reasons that I've talked about, that the Brits had always had this deeply uneasy relationship with the EU. Um, and we also know that people, when they vote on issues, they don't always vote on them in the way that rationally minded political scientists or economists would think about, right? They don't do sort of cost benefit analyses in the way that we might. And this is one of the big problems with a lot of political science, right? Is we tend to assume people are interpreting the world in the way that we might as social scientists. Um, so it was really striking to see the election results for Trump in many ways mirror the type of results that we saw with Brexit. And one thing that I really picked up on in my own work is that place seems to matters, matter a lot. And in fact, you have the sort of geography of voting for uh, the sort of disruption of people like Trump or like Brexit um, that are coming from places that in many ways seem to have lost out on um, the last 30 years of economic growth and innovation in the, in the economy. Right, so you have places that really are suffering in in great ways, um, but the the sad thing is that they're voting for people and things that are actually going to make their suffering worse. So how do we explain that as political scientists? And the thing that I do in my work and have done for a long time is to try to think about the lens that people are seeing the world, not in terms again of sort of cost benefit theories that we might have, you know, often taken from economics and neoclassical economics, but to think about the ways in which people interpret what's going on and the narratives that they're hearing from political leaders about uh, what's going on. And it's been fascinating to see in the EU how narratives have mattered a lot. So in the Eurozone crisis, which begins in 2009 or so, um, and ends up being a very, very challenging time um, for the countries that have the euro, right? Where certain countries that borrowed way too much on international financial markets had to, had to try to pay back what they borrowed and they couldn't. And so they were going into debt and there was efforts to try to figure out, well, how do we keep these countries from defaulting on their debts and then dragging the whole eurozone down and so on and so forth. And for a very, very long time, there was a narrative that Northern voters in places like Germany 
and the Netherlands and Austria and other places had about that we shouldn't have to pay for, for these people. Um, but what we've seen is a huge breakthrough um, by Germany in particular with Angela Merkel, where she was able to put forward a narrative about the importance of coming together and banding together to kind of save the European Union for everyone's long run health and prosperity. And actually there was a recent uh, decision to create this new coronavirus fund um, to finance it through a first ever European wide financed public debt instrument of a bond, a cor coronavirus bond, right? So what we've seen is instead of crisis dragging down the European cooperative effort, there's actually been an ability by political elites to reframe what's going on and actually show why cooperation and forward movement and a more progressive, what we might call a progressive policy of banding together and financing this debt to help people who are desperately in need of economic help, um, that that actually is a better way forward than, uh, you know, closing up and not sharing resources and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, hopefully the European experience might provide a little ray of, of light and hope about how um, something like the global pandemic might be used by uh, political elites and political leaders in strategic ways to move forward societies instead of seeing them move backwards. So I've made the argument that the EU is innovative, but of course, anyone who reads Professor Nexon's work can know that in fact, that's not at all true, right? But the problem is most people, their notion of history sort of starts in, you know, 1900 or something. Um, it is absolutely the case that the EU is back to the future, that it sort of represents um, in many ways a sort of confederation system, um, a patchwork of different governing authorities um, that if we go back and look at the, you know, the types of uh, political entities that, that you have studied, Professor Nixon, in your own work, um, we can see, I think, a lot of this sort of sense of the tensions and loyalties and the overlapping governance systems and so on and so forth. Um, and so in my own work, uh, I very much tried to get people to take a much longer view uh, when they think about the politics around us today. Um, because we do see these sort of reoccurring patterns of political life over centuries. Um, and so I really want us to think about the EU in this historical way. And then I think we'll understand it much better. And when we think and we look out to sort of what are the biggest challenges that the EU is facing uh, over the coming years, I once again think history is helpful to us in, in thinking about those challenges. Um, I think an ongoing, incredibly important challenge will be around what a lot of commentators, including Vox folks, and in fact, I was quoted recently in a Vox article that, that had, had this in the headline, is sort of, is this Europe's Hamiltonian moment, right? Um, is this the moment where in fact, European leaders will come together and actually mutualize their debt meaning they will join their debt together. They'll develop a fiscal union, taxing and spending at the EU level. Again, with the global pandemic, they have gone forward in some baby steps kind of ways. They've agreed to a, uh, a plastics tax, right? Um, they've ag agreed to a digital tax, right? Both things that fit into the EU's efforts around climate change and environmental issues and around Kind of making sure that uh, technology companies and their you know don't sort of monopolize the world um, but they really have very very limited fiscal ability and so for this creaky you know sort of rickety thing of the eu to work they need to match the euro with a fiscal union that really consolidates the power over spending in Brussels at the EU level. And if you go back, it is literally exactly the same debate that Alexander Hamilton was having with Thomas Jefferson and others, right? Should Washington have all this power or should the states really remain the ones that, that keep the levers of economic governance 
firmly in their hands. So that they, they have to figure that out. Otherwise the whole thing will fall apart. The second really, really important thing that we haven't talked about that is so, so critical is actually the EU needs to step up and deal with the erosion in democracy and rule of law that has been going on in countries in East, Eastern Europe. Um, so the, the, the head of the EU right now, Ursula von der Leyen, um, is a member of a, a sort of um, mid, middle right conservative party. Um, and she has not moved as aggressively as many people have called for in dealing with particularly Hungary, where Viktor Orban, the, the head of uh, Hungary, has consistently acted in ways that repress um, journalists, that rule, roll back judges and rule of law, that repress the democratic processes. And Hungary arguably has strayed very far away from sort of the model of liberal democracy that they had to meet in order to enter the EU in the first place after the fall of the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe um, liberalizes and democratizes. So this is hugely important, but we have not seen uh, the members of, and Angela Merkel also has been criticized for this, we have not seen these folks who are members of this sort of transnational political party that view Orban more positively because he does have these sort of socially conservative uh, viewpoints and so on. Um, so this is a cataclysmically important thing that for the EU to get right, and it has not yet. And again, we see echoes of history in this. Um, a political scientist at, at Michigan, Robert uh, Mickey, has written this great book, um, Paths Out of Dixie. That's what it's called, right? Preston Nixon. And he talks about how after the Civil War, we had pockets of authoritarianism in the United States in the Southern states that again, the Northerners and the, and the sort of federal elites let go on because they wanted to keep the American Union together. And so I think we're seeing something very similar in the case of the EU. And that you know, has real repercussions for people within Hungary. It is a real black spot on the EU, which has always had this sort of notion that it has these really strong norms that are positive and democratic and liberal. And so to me, that's the second really big thing that needs to be dealt with. Um, there are a variety of different uh, ways of sanctioning Orban and sanctioning Hungary and making them come, come to heel, but the EU has not acted on those.